All right. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to uh, Matthew 22? Uh, Matthew 22. Is it? Uh, I apologize for the uh, audio quality this morning. I'm not really sure what's uh, going on, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and get started nonetheless, and uh, hopefully the recording will be uh, better for later. And uh, so if you have your Bibles in uh, Matthew chapter 22, uh, this morning we're backing up in the life of Jesus uh, a little bit, and we're looking at uh, an event in his life uh, where the Pharisees were seeking to tempt him, and they, uh, they tried to throw a, a hard question towards him. And uh, this morning, I, I think our passage has um, a lot to say about our own situation here uh, currently uh, that we're in in this world. Uh, and in, as a familiar passage, uh, we'll all, of course, be bringing uh, a little something of an understanding to this, but I hope that we can see um, a deeper meaning to what Jesus is saying here. And so if you have your Bibles in Matthew 22, this morning we'll be reading in verse 15 to verse 22. The scripture says, Then went the Pharisees and took to counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And he sent out unto him, uh, they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teach us the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness, and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he said unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled, and left him, and went their way. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for the day that you've given us. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'd help us to use it for your glory this morning. And Lord, to render to you all that we have, Lord, uh, everything that we have to give, that we would turn it over to you this morning. Uh, we pray this morning that you'd be with all of your people, Lord, uh, in all of the uh, services and all the homes that are uh, worshiping you this morning. Uh, we pray that uh, you would use us all uh, for your glory, especially us here uh, this morning, that you would send us out to preach the gospel and to witness Christ to someone this, this week. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd give us the words to say there. Uh, be with our missionaries where they're at to the same end. Uh, be with our leaders and help them to know how they ought to lead us. And Lord, give us the, uh, the wisdom to give them the due honor that's, uh, that's, that's due to them, Lord, uh, never denying your uh, sovereignty over us. And Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, that you'd forgive us and that you'd take us uh, safely to the day of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So as I said, this morning we're looking at this event in Christ's life where the Pharisees, as they often did, sought to ensnare Jesus. They were trying to lay a trap for him to find an occasion to put him to death, and they were trying to use the government to do so. Uh, we even see in our passage that they sent, in verse 16, that they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. That is the, the, the sect of, of uh, uh, political ideology and, and sort of uh, personality worship of Herod, who was, who was uh, a governor in that day. Uh, that They sent to him, to Jesus, their disciples, to bring the Herodians to him and ask him this question. They say, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Uh, they, they were asking, is it okay for us to pay tribute to this foreign power? And they even were sort of uh, goading him to give a, uh, a rash response, you'll notice. In verse 16, they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teach us the way of God 
neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Uh, they, they're, they're goading him and they're saying, don't give us an answer that would please Caesar. We know that you don't care about Caesar. We know that you don't give honor to uh, any man unduly. And you don't care to, to, to speak against men as long as it's in the way of God. And so they said, uh, what, uh, what should we do? Should we pay to Caesar or not pay to Caesar? Uh, implying and, and trying to goad him to say, do not pay tribute to Caesar. Do not pay your taxes because uh, th they wanted to find an occasion to get the government to arrest him. And so they were laying a trap for him. They, they were trying to find this occasion to kill Jesus. But Jesus, of course, in a, a stunning display that is known by everybody who has heard about Jesus almost, uh, turns this back towards them. He says in verse 18, Jesus perceiving, uh, perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he said unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Christ did not deny the obligation of citizens to give tribute to their leaders, to, 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 uh, to honor the, the leaders that have been put over them uh, in in the manner of their civil obligations. Uh, he said, well, whose mark is on this money? He says, who's, uh, whose signature is on the money? Who, who, to who does this money belong? Who gave you this money? And of course, Caesar, he, they, you know, Caesar was the one who minted the money. He's the one that sent the money out to be distributed. And so he says, render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's. He, he, he affirms the obligation of citizens to obey their, uh, their rulers. We are, as Jesus said here, to uh, render to them in our customs and our taxes, in, in giving them out of our uh, increase. In Romans 13, 6, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Uh, pay them their taxes, give them their honor. And again, to, to give them respect as is due to them. In Romans 13.1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for as there is no power but of God. The powers that, are, that be are ordained of God. This also includes desiring their good. Jesus is is uh, not saying to do this in a a, a, a mean spirited way, uh, or or in a way uh, hating the the one that you're uh, you're uh, paying this to, but rather you're supposed to desire their good. And even in the scripture, we know that we're supposed to pray for our rulers. In 1 Timothy 2, uh, 2 verse 1, I exhort therefore that first all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and, f and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Uh, he says for the gospel's sake uh, that we should pray for our leaders, we, uh, that it's good and acceptable. It's, it's a command to us that if we would be accepted before God, if our service would be accepted, that we ought to pray for our rulers. Also, we are in whatsoever capacity we're able to, to render obedience to the things that the government commands of us. In Titus 3 verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness to all men. Uh, we're to be subject to the powers, to those in authority over us, to obey them, to be ready to every good work that 
uh, that we can do towards them and to be uh, above all in it gentle be peacekeepers in it in Romans 13 2 whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God for they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation for rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil wilt thou then be not be afraid of the power do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same Jesus when he said render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's is not only saying the money he's not just saying pay your taxes but he's saying whatever God has given to that ruler for you to render to that ruler render it to them whether it be money or obedience or in in offering prayers up to uh, to God for them and seeking their good uh, we're to do that. We're to, we're to offer up. Uh, and so what Jesus is saying here is not uh, what the Pharisees were at all looking for. Uh, Jesus in the first statement seems to be right on the government side. Uh, and he's saying that if they charge me tribute, then I pay to them tribute because that is the place God has put them in. And so that Jesus puts government in its proper place uh, above the citizenry uh, to, for the citizenry to render to them according to their office. But he doesn't stop there either. Jesus does not just say, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. In verse 21 again, he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. There's often, when we look at this passage, especially among the, the worldly scholars and, and, and the, the worldly expositors of this passage, there's an overemphasis put on the first half. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's absolutely true, and we should emphasize that. But there is often overlooking the second half. Render to God the things that are God's. What things are we obligated to give to God here? First off, just as the ruler is due customs and, and uh, a, a portion of our increase, so do we owe God a portion. We owe to him just as we owe to them. Do you think that the penny that was in Christ's hand, that he said, render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, do you think that that penny did not belong to God? Was it not his? Did he not make it? Surely the Romans digged up the copper or the, the other uh, base metal and they uh, forged it into coins and they sent it out and their superscription was on it but in an ultimate sense who does that really belong to of course it belongs to God God made it God was the one who put it in the world and so just as it is due to Caesar more so it is due to God also uh, primarily it is his and of course, he's commanded us to render custom to whom custom is due, uh, honor to whom honor is due, taxes, and, and all that. And so, because the money is his, we render. We give to those in authority over us. In fact, it's the reason why we uh, have to obey that command that he's given to us. Because it belongs to him. Because we, uh, we ought to do with his property uh, what he desires as he's lent it out to us. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the, of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Just as we pay to them, we pay to him also. Revelation 4 verse 11 also says that as we render honor to earthly authorities, we must more render honor to God. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We know that uh, as far as their moral uh, ability and, the, and their, their moral character, we know that politicians are not often worthy of honor, that, that they are, are, are deceptive, that they're slimy. We don't, we don't say that they're always uh, good persons and worthy of honor. How much more is, should we then render honor to him that is worthy of all honor? And when he says, render honor to whom honor is due, custom to whom custom, then we obey him at his word. We also again owe God our service. Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're to present ourselves, all that we are, as a living sacrifice to God. And that's our reasonable service. That's the, 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 the service that is, uh, that is uh, logical, that, that makes sense, that we should offer our entire selves. Again, our uh, leaders, uh, the rulers of this world, often uh, exact unreasonable service. And yet, because of God, because of his command to us, we, uh, we ought to obey in those things that we have the moral leave to do so. And of course, we owe God worship on his day. Exodus 20 verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And in Hebrews 10 24, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We ought to give God uh, all right and due service to Him, which is all service. Whatever we can do to bring Him honor and glory, we give to Him. And we have a greater obligation to do that than to the kings of this world. And of course, more than this, there are many other things that we ought to do, but we have no time to number them this morning. And so now we've seen the sense of what Christ is saying. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to him custom, render to him honor, render to him obedience and service and keeping of peace. And render to God the things that are God's, more so than to Caesar. In fact, the reason we ought to render to Caesar is because God himself commands it. And we even see God himself in our passage commanded by Jesus Christ. And so, that's the sense that Jesus is saying. And so, this uh, helps us to think through some issues that we have today. What about when we have contrary commands from the government, contrary to what God has commanded us, contrary to what we owe to God as our reasonable service? As we see, God's authority is always above their authority. Romans 13.1 says, There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, just as we read earlier. Their power is subordinate to His power and comes from His power. If any have authority, if any have uh, uh, any uh, ability to uh, constrain men, God has given that authority to them. Whenever authority, a submission to authority is mentioned in the scriptures, it is always, and I would, I would put money down on anybody who could find a passage in the scripture that, does not, that, that speaks to the submission to authority and yet does not also entail greater submission to God's authority or base the command to submit to authority on God's authority. 1 Peter 2 verse 13 is a great test case for this. We read, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake because of him, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him 
for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. How many times there did he mention the authority of God? That, that we ought to submit, we ought to be peacekeepers, we ought to render because of what God has told us and His authority. Notice even our own passage is in the context of the law of God. What has God said about this? In verse 17, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And of course he said, Render to Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. It's a question of, the law, what has God said, what is His authority that we should do in this thing? And so the, the answer becomes obvious when we hear about contrary commands. When we hear in our own nation that uh, many churches are not even being permitted to meet in a parking lot service like we're having this morning. They're being forbidden to gather together. They're, they're told to forsake the assembling of themselves together. The answer is that God's authority and our obligations to Him always supersede our obligations to the government. We ought to meet together because that is what God told us to do. And so we should, we should obey Him. I'd just like to, to mention a few examples in the Scripture. Again, over and over again, when we see contrary commands in the Scripture, we always see that the right thing that's advocated for is to obey God rather than men. In Exodus 1.15 we read, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was uh, Shipra, and the name of the other Puah. And he said... When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Pharaoh was the authority in that at that time. Uh, his uh, seat of power was given to him by God. God gives authority to whoever he pleases. And so he had, uh, pe people had obligation to render to him, to, to give custom to him, to obey him and keep the peace in his land. And yet when the Hebrew midwives were commanded to do something contrary to the law of God, they did not do it. They obeyed God rather than men. Consider 1 Kings 18 and verse 3 about Ahab and Jezebel. The Ahab call, uh, called uh, Abida, uh, which was the governor of his house. Now Abida uh, feared the Lord God, uh, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Abida took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So what happened there? Jezebel, the queen of Israel, Ahab's wife, had commanded all the prophets of the Lord to be killed. But this man, a faithful man, took them and hid them in a cave and fed them with bread and water. He disobeyed the commands of the civil authorities. And yet we know that he did well and that he was blessed for this. In Daniel 6, verse 6, we also read about Darius and Daniel. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said, unto, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. 
a command just not to pray to anyone, not to ask a petition or, or, or a favor or anything for, from anybody for 30 days uh, except to ask it of the king. But in verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel disobeyed the civil authorities. Daniel continued to worship God in his common way. And so he was cast to the lions. And of course, we know that God delivered him. But he disobeyed and he was counted faithful when he disobeyed the authorities. We could continue and talk about the rulers of Judah. We can talk about the Roman authorities and times when the Christians disobeyed them to meet in uh, worship to God. We can even talk about modern examples of those in persecuted countries who for meeting together would be thrown into prison or killed or any other number of things could be done to them simply for meeting together and worshiping God in the common way. And we know that they are counted faithful. And we know that God's authority is above the authorities of this world. And so, believers, I wanted to wait until after Easter to deliver uh, this sermon. And that's because uh, around that time, of course, we needed strengthening in the Lord. This was all beginning, and we needed to look to Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. But I would like to ask your patience for a moment if I admonish us all a little bit. Will a viral pneumonia and the unlawful commands of certain governors in this nation steal away our vigor for worshiping God or make us question whether we should meet as God has commanded us if our own governor should forbid us to even assemble in this way that we have here. I think that just as Jesus said, we ought to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and no more, and that we ought to render to God the things that are God's. Hebrews 12:3. Uh, let us look again to Jesus and see how He rendered to God all that was God's. For consider Him that endured much contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In verse 21 again, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. I pray that we would have uh, a continuing uh, love for worship for God in our hearts, uh, that we would see the uh, governing authorities in their right uh, light according to the Word of God, uh, that we are only supposed to obey them because it is God's will that we obey them. But if it's God's will that we come and worship together, then we ought, as much as our capacity is and our health allows it, to come and worship together. And so I pray that we would keep that in mind in the days ahead. And now if there's an unbeliever here, I'd like to tell you what is due to God from you this morning. And have you not already failed to give it to God? Romans 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. That is, many evils that they've sought out, and that you and I have sought out. We've not rendered to God the things that are His, and for that He is a just judge. If God is the judge of the rulers of this world, will He not also judge us, their subjects? Hebrews 10.30 says, For we know Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If we were to go before God, 
by ourselves, by our own righteousness, God would strike us down. It is a fearful thing to fall into His hands without the righteousness of Christ. But God is willing to pardon today. God is willing to forgive. He has provided the legal grounds for your full acquittal in Jesus Christ in His death. And therefore, I ask that you would entrust yourself to Him. John 3.35 says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into His hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so Jesus Christ has authority to condemn, but also authority to save. And so I pray you would entrust yourself to his saving hand of mercy. And again, believers, let's go from this place knowing, of course, that Christ loves us and that Christ is for us and that we uh, shall not come into condemnation, but knowing that we still ought to continue the fight in this lifetime. Uh, even if we're up against governments and against the will of the people, we ought to obey God rather than men. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, your love towards us. Uh, we thank you for your law, Lord, uh, that keeps us on the straight and narrow. Lord, we pray that you would help us to look ever to Christ and to... Uh, have continuing forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we ask that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us this week and bring us back into fellowship with you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to know what we ought to do in the days ahead, especially concerning preaching the gospel. And we ask that you would send us someone that we can talk to about Christ. Be with our missionaries and our leaders as you always are. And Lord, we ask that you'd keep us safe until Christ's coming. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen.